Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, wrap up our conversation about conservation biology. Again, things to remember, what are the factors behind the species extinction that we're seeing? You know, 10 to 20 percent of the species on our planet going extinct in our lifetimes is a pretty, it's a significant issue. And we got to look at why, what are the causes? How do we minimize those causes or reduce them? We're not going to eliminate them altogether, but what can we do to decrease that impact? So instead of 10 to 20 percent, could we pull it back to maybe 5 percent? That's still an issue, but it's a much more manageable issue than 10 to 20. So that is the goal of conservation, trying to educate people about this and help them understand the importance and the value of species, not just the direct value, but also that indirect value we talked about. And then how do we make educated decisions on species preservation? So when a species is classified as extinct, there are no known living members of your species you're gone now something definitely to mention sometimes extinction happens on a global scale like dinosaurs they're gone other times extinctions happen on a regional scale we may say oh the pop this population of this particular songbird is extinct from Illinois, but it's still found in Missouri and Iowa and other places. So we do have to take that into consideration. When we use the word extinction, what level of extinction? Is it global extinction of that species, or is it a regional extinction? So extinction is natural. Dinosaurs went extinct because of that great big meteor 65 million years ago. But not all extinctions are natural. The great auk, that penguin looking like bird next to the dinosaur, we killed them all. We ate them. It's gone. It's extinct. Just like the passenger pigeon, just like the dodo. Those are things that went extinct because of human actions. Okay, so what a conservation biologist will try to do is set up a recovery plan. They say, okay, if we identify a population that is vulnerable, threatened, or endangered, let's put together a plan to recover that population. Okay, so the first step in a recovery plan is to survey, oh, survey the population. Okay, how big is it right now? How many males versus females? What's the reproductive strategy of that population? What's the survivorship curve? That's all of that population ecology information we covered in the previous chapters. So we need that information to then know, okay, what are we trying to do? What's our goal? So we survey. Then we look at step two. What's the action plan? Okay, so here's our action plan. You know, do we restore habitat? Is that the reason why the population is not doing well? Do we reintroduce members of the population? Do we relocate them? So we get wolves from Canada and brought them to Yellowstone. Do we plant trees? Do we put in more prairie, etc.? So the action plan is based on the reason or reasons the species is threatened or endangered. So why build habitat if your species is going extinct because of pollution? Identify the cause and tackle the cause with your action plan. Otherwise, you're wasting time, money, effort, energy, etc. Now, once you have your action plan, we have to make sure we have the third step here. What is your timeline? What is your budget? All right. It's not going to happen in a year or two or five. It may take 50 years to recover the population. Bald eagles didn't bounce back overnight. It took decades. It took probably 50 to 60 years to get the bald eagle from endangered back to threatened status. What's the budget? How many millions of dollars? If you're talking about habitat restoration, you may have to buy land. You may have to plant prairie grasses, reforest it, etc. And the big thing to keep in mind when we're talking about timelines and budgets is that most all conservation plans will span 
a long time, multiple years, it might be five, eight, 10, 20 years. Consider politics and political parties and how that will change over the course of your management plan. Sometimes political parties are very supportive of conservation. Other times they're very um, not supportive. So you have to have that in mind that, wow, if in 15 years we need X amount of more dollars, what if the political party in power at that time does not support your plan? How do you adjust? How do you manage? That's a concern. That's a huge issue, especially in today's society. So once we get our timeline and our budget set up and the process is going, the plan is action, in, in action, it's moving forward, we then have to constantly monitor. Okay, so we're constantly monitoring and evaluating, is the plan working? What are the population levels? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Let's look at all those variables. Now, this is simply too big of a task for any government agency to tackle. Department of Natural Resources cannot monitor the deer population with their, with their enforcement officers. It's too big of a job. So this is where we reach out to citizens. Everybody who lives in the state of Illinois helps monitor the deer population. You get into an accident, you kill a deer, you call it in, you report it. Everybody who hunts calls it in and reports it. That is the nature of conservation. It's something the entire society needs to be supporting and working on to help make these plans successful. So bird watching, Ottoman society is out there doing phenomenal work about monitoring bird populations and bird sightings. Every one of you could go to the Audubon Society website, do the bird app, and if you see a bird in your backyard, you go to the app and say, hey, I saw a cardinal in my backyard. I saw this particular songbird. Maybe it was a finch. Maybe it was a morning dove, etc." And you put that data into their system, and it helps them understand population levels. So it takes an entire community to do this. It's not just a few individuals. So when we get all this put together, the most critical, the most important step of any conservation plan is the last one. You gotta educate the public. Why is it important to do this? What is the value of that conservation plan? Why should we keep that species around? So a lot of conservation is focusing on kids, teaching kids the value. Because if I have a plan that's going to take 35 years to move a population, a species from endangered to threatened, I want these kids supporting it when they become adults and they start voting and they're paying taxes and they're hunting and they're fishing and they're going to school. I want them to understand it and learn about it and see the value in it. Without that, the plans cannot, they're not successful. They can't work if you don't have public support and the public is not aware of it. So for folks who are interested, there is an absolutely phenomenal conservation plan going on at Emmaquan. This is up near Havana, Beardstown, Havana. It's actually in Lewiston as the official um, address for it. But uh, the Nature Conservancy is working up there. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is working up there. And then the University of Illinois Springfield is working up there. And what they've been doing is they're restoring the natural floodplain of the Illinois River. So decades ago, that river was redirected and altered to create farm ground and they started seeing major major ecological problems well about 10 years ago they started rechanneling the river or bringing the river back to its original channel allowing it to flood out into those areas that are natural flood plains and there's some just some amazing science happening up there um, Dr. Mike Lemke is a professor at UIS who is doing some incredible research up there. There's a whole host of different people doing research. They have discovered 
new spe species coming back to the area that hadn't been there in decades. Diversity is increasing. Wildlife is rebuilding. Populations are growing. It's a phenomenal success story. The amazing thing is this is a global example. People from all over the world have come to Emiquan, Emiquan to Lewiston, Illinois, to learn how to restore floodplains by looking at what they're doing up there. So an amazing opportunity. If you guys have the interest, check with the folks at UIS. They offer classes up there. If you're not interested in a class about it, just go up there. It's public property. You can go up there and go fishing, go hunting, go hiking, go explore the property and see some amazing diversity of wildlife, prairie, floodplains, all sorts of just amazing stuff is happening up there that it took a long time to get it going, but we see some phenomenal success. All right, so conservation, the bottom line, if everybody can do one little thing today, recycle today, reduce your waste production, reduce your fuel usage, save yourselves money. It also is good for conservation and is good for the diversity of life on Earth and is good for the overall health of our planet.